Peter Thiel once said, we wanted flying cars. Instead, we got 140 characters. Of course, that's changed. Tweets, or posts, can now be any length. Twitter is now called X, and we still don't have flying cars. We do have helicopters, though, which sort of fit the bill if you put wheels on them. More so if they can be run on electricity so they're not so noisy. Then they basically become large drones which transport large cargo like humans. These are the flying cars of today, what they call electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles or eVTOLs. Basically, there's a number of use cases for these large drones. They can transport cargo or they can transport humans, perhaps for tourism purposes, or they can act as flying taxis, presumably on fixed routes. McKinsey has described this space as air mobility. And you see here they're forecasting, and this generally matches estimates coming from other subject matter experts, that by 2030, which is basically four years away now, they're expecting around $3 billion in revenues to come from air mobility operators. Here you can see they've been compared to airlines. So basically you're going to see lots of daily flights for shorter durations. And when it comes to the companies that are closest to realizing this build it and they will come thesis, Ehang really sits at the top because they're furthest along. And you can see a number of names on this list. Today we're going to be focused on publicly traded eVTOL companies, basically the larger names in the list, which all coincidentally happen to be the ones that are most likely to debut commercial flights soonest. And when we look at the progress that eHang has been making, it's largely in China. So they have over 40 operational sites set up. They claim to have flown 10,000 successful flights during the first half of this year. And you see here they talk about how these flights are paving the way for the expected launch of public-facing commercial operation services within this year. So aside from just some tourist sites offering rides in an eHang, we'd like to see some proper commercial operations. That means fixed routes being flown at significant numbers on a daily basis. And you need to be very careful about news because that's largely what most of these companies, with eHang perhaps being the exception, they largely just issue press releases to keep the investor base excited. Here you can see they talk about how Chinese air taxi maker eHang completes Made in flight in Abu Dhabi. Well, there's actually another EV toll provider that's expected to operate routes in Abu Dhabi as well. But maiden flights don't mean anything. They say, well, that will expedite the launch progress. Flying these contraptions in various geographies is really different from operating commercial routes. So that's what we're really looking for here. Commercial operations. So we can start to understand the economics of this build it and they will come thesis. Here you can see a piece recently which talks about how Saudis have signed this game-changing deal to launch flying cars and air taxis. And you read it further, it's a memorandum of understanding. These are largely just public relations fodder. They're the legal equivalent of a handshake. So be very focused if you're invested in eVTOL companies about commercial progress, and that comes in the form of revenues. Now, when we look at eHang, the first thing to note here, it's actually a VI structure. So these VI structures are how the vast majority of Chinese tech firms trade in the United States, and they're frankly quite shady. So you don't have a legal right to the shares that you think you're holding. It clearly states that, and this has been studied in a past piece that we did on the dangers of investing in Chinese stocks. So it's something that is a showstopper for us, but for a lots of folks it isn't. And when you look at the past share price performance, I think it's worth noting it has about the same five-year return as the NASDAQ. That's worth pointing out because it implies that it hasn't necessarily been hyped. At least recently, you see that it has been hyped in the past, that extreme spike there. But if we look at their simple valuation ratio, which is simply market cap divided by annualized revenues, we see that's about 13. So that's using trailing 12 months because there's a lot of volatility in their revenues. But we would wouldn't consider this to be dramatically overpriced. So our catalog average, I think, is sitting somewhere around eight. So an SVR of 13 isn't horrible. It's what you would expect for a growth stock, right? But then when we move to looking at the one-year chart 
It shows a lot of volatility. So this is the sort of firm that you're likely to see pumped by the fin twats, right? So just be very careful about that. And when you're dabbling in volatile stocks, just set yourself a valuation ratio target, not a price target, and use that accordingly to decide when your dollar cost averaging. If shares get too expensive, then you don't add at those levels. You only add under a particular target. Now, when it comes to revenue growth, there's a couple things worth noting. They started off rather strong there in 2024 and then 2025 estimated revenues just in the double digits. That's not really the sort of growth that we'd be expecting to see. They have some customer concentration risks. So last year, 26% of their revenues came from a single customer. That's worth noting. And last year, they sold 216 units of their EH216 series eVTOL aircraft. So they're selling craft. That's great. That means those will be used to fly people around. And they sold 208 units in China and eight units over overseas. So this is largely a play on eVTOL aircraft, at least as of now, within China. And as you can see here on the right, the revenue streams are rather volatile. But what's worth noting here is the price. So they're selling for $410,000 for international markets, $335,000 inside China with 90% of their sales inside China. And when we try to describe what it is they're doing, so we would envision these companies are trying to offer vertically integrated platforms so that they're not just selling aircraft, but there's also a services component, a much presumably higher margin piece of their business that supplements the sale of aircraft. And you see here, they talk about how products relate to the sale of their EH216 craft, and then they have related services with the intent to extend into long range intercity air transportation, where presumably they're operating some fixed routes. Now, when we look at their financials here, you can see the vast majority of revenues coming from products right now with a cost of goods sold reflecting a gross margin of around 67% for services, 61% for product. That's quite good. So just some thoughts in Ehang. I know there's a lot of interest in this name from our subscribers and we never invest in buy structures. Uh, you might want to. I think those gross margins are fairly attractive. We certainly want to monitor those over time and they're supposed to be vertically integrated. So it'd be nice to see some more detail detail on that from investor relations. They have lots of vague flowery statements and metrics, but we need something more tangible to understand how they're developing revenues outside of just selling aircraft. And revenue growth stalling is a concern, but it's just early days, right? And just remember that not all revenues are created equal, which is why Joby now has revenues, but they're of a different type. This is a very interesting piece of news that came out. So Blade Air Mobility is basically a firm that flies these sort of fixed routes using helicopters. So the idea would be there, of course, to swap out those helicopters with eVTOL aircraft when the time comes. So Blade Air actually sold their passenger segment to Joby. So now Joby actually has routes that are being flown, of course, with helicopters. And the idea will be that they plug in EV tolls and eventually autonomy leads them to operate those much more profitably than choppers. So analysis that we've seen in the past shows that a piloted eVTOL craft will not have a cost advantage over a helicopter. It's the autonomy that gives it the cost advantage. And when we look at this transaction, Joby's acquisition of that passenger segment, you see here revenues for the passenger segment for Blade were declining as a percentage of total revenues over time. It's rather interesting that 84% of their adjusted EBITDA duh or basically profitability came from that medical segment whilst the passenger segment wasn't overly contributing to profits as you can see here but what we want to do is understand what Joby has acquired so we pulled the passenger revenues for Blade Air Mobility and charted them over time as you can see here they're quite volatile so then we calculated those using a trailing 12 months and that smooths everything out nicely and you can see that the growth of that passenger segment appears to have stalled and perhaps that's why Blade Air wanted to exit that.
What's interesting to note is that they were actually seeing gross margins strengthen over time for that particular segment to around, let's say, 28%. So that's not overly exciting, to be honest. You certainly want to see better gross margins than that, I think, and that's where the autonomy element comes into play. So what you can now do for Joby is start to monitor the growth. So presumably to grow that passenger segment, they'll need to add more routes, but we can now start monitoring their gross margins, and when they introduce autonomous craft, we should see those gross margins increase from that 28% benchmark upwards significantly, I would hope. And what's going to be great about that is since Joby already has these routes being flown, they can very quickly, once they get approval, plug in those EV tolls and we can start to understand the economics better. So then we can better understand how lucrative this build it and they will come thesis actually is. And because they're using EV tolls, then they're probably able to expand existing routes, which they may not be able to fly at certain hours, for example, because helicopters are quite noisy. So once you have drones that are a lot more quiet, then you can fly more routes, presumably at additional times. Now, the current valuation for Joby is ludicrous, as are lots of companies out there with no revenue, so you can't understand the economics of their business. Probably one of the best red flags we have for catching crap would be not investing in companies that don't have revenues. But Joby now has revenues, if we're careful to distinguish that these are not related to the thesis that we're investing in, which is EV tolls. But if we use those trailing 12 months worth of revenues that they've acquired from Blade Air, their simple valuation ratio, again, market cap divided by annualized revenues is around 149. So our catalog average is at eight. We don't invest in anything, let's say over three times our catalog average. So this is very, very overvalued. If they captured half of that 2030 opportunity, which would be around $1.5 billion, they'd have an SVR around 10. So it's really priced for the assumption that they're going to be capturing a lot of that potential revenue by 2030. Now, the big question, of course, we asked Grok, when does Joby expect to begin operating commercial flights? Of course, these timelines keep moving out. According to their SPAC decks, they should already be dominating the entire planet. But they expect to begin commercial passenger flights in early 2026, starting in Dubai. So if that actually happens, I'll probably have to pop over there and try the whole thing out. They have the planned opening of their first Vertiport at Dubai International Airport earlier next year. And for the U.S., they're expecting to enter the final phase of FAA certification testing next year. So quite vague, but certainly one would hope that, as I said, once they get that approval, they should be able to get those craft flying very quickly. Now, there are actually six publicly traded eVTOL stocks here. You see them listed out. Anything under a billion dollar market cap we're just not interested in. So I've circled the names that we're going to talk about today, or at least touch on Joby, we just discussed. Then there's Archer Aviation. So this is simply these firms market cap. We have Eve Holding and Ehang Holdings, which we already talked about. So when does Archer expect to begin operating commercial flights? I mean, if you're an investor here, that's all you care about, right? An update is simply looking at how that date has moved and how rigid it is and how much funding essentially they're going to need to raise waiting to start commercial operations. Hopefully they don't go bankrupt, right? Like all those electric vehicle companies did. So they expect, Archer expects to begin operating commercial flights later this year with their initial launch also planned for the UAE in Abu Dhabi. And they say, of course, for the U.S., early commercial deployments are targeted for next year pending FAA type certification. Of course, right? It's all pending on FAA approval, which needs to happen. Then you have Eve Holding, a less exciting company. They're expecting to launch commercial EV toll flights in 2027. And they talk about how latest updates here confirm 2027 for commercial service pending regulatory approval. Again, it all comes down to the regulators, right? So just a few additional thoughts here. Until these firms can achieve positive operating cash flows, they're going to need to keep raising capital. If you're an investor in these companies, don't make the mistake that most retail investors do, which is to not pay attention to that share count increasing over time. Take a look in their financials. You'll see they're selling shares to raise capital or they're taking on debt, which can result in large payments and potentially instability, right? That's how a lot of companies get themselves into trouble. They take on a lot of debt, they can't service it, and lenders say, oh, we're not going to loan you anything more, and then they go bankrupt. Really can't 
emphasize this enough. Autonomy is a critically important component of this thesis for numerous reasons, perhaps the biggest one being that pilots are expensive and there's a shortage of pilots. So if you're going to run these craft on fixed routes, you better have autonomy enabled as quickly as possible so that you can scale. As I said before, crude choppers are said to operate at around the same cost as crude eVTOL aircraft, right? So we need autonomy. In my mind, there's no rush to invest in any of these firms. I mean, I suppose you never know when this becomes the next hyped sector, right? And the fin twats run it up into the stars and then it comes crashing back down again. When you have stocks that are significantly overvalued, one of two things is going to happen. Either the fundamentals are going to catch up or the valuation is going to revert back to the mean. So when it comes to the companies we've talked about today, I think Joby's the one to watch here as they're going to deploy in the United States. And we have a lot more transparency coming from their financials than we do for Ehang. As I said, Ehang is really not investable as far as we're concerned because of that VI structure. And they need to start providing more metrics that investors can follow so they can better understand the business model of this company. Now, basically, eVTOLs are large drones. In doing the research for today's video, I came across a fair number of comments in their collateral about how they're pivoting over towards the defense realm, which is hot right now. So we've looked at five hot drone stocks that investors in eVTOLs might find interesting. Give that video a watch next. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.